Thank you, Professor Chiao Jie. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm very, very happy to be here. So I'd like to thank the sponsors for inviting me to this um, excellent session. I've been enjoying the talks so far. Um, like uh, Professor Chiao Jie said, I'm actually from Sydney, Australia. Um, I am Chinese, but um, I've been in Australia for 35 years, so my Chinese is, is very, very bad. But I did, I did try and practice, so I will um, try a phrase on you and see whether you can understand. Um, uh, <laughs> so that's all my Chinese. So we can't ask any questions in Chinese. It has to be translated. Okay, so let's start. So my topic today is on ovarian, hypers, uh, ovarian stimulation. Carrying uh, on with uh, Dr. Uh, Vasan's talk, we are going to move to the other end of the spectrum. We started with um, ovarian hyperstimulation. We are going to move on to poor responders. And then I'm also going to talk about AMH. And the last talk is on the role of elevated progesterones in IVF cycles. Right, so this is the, the three talks I'm going to be talking about. The first one is um, uh, comparing two different types of stimulation protocols for poor responders. Then we are going to move on to a talk on AMH levels to see whether there's any change in AMH levels after a stimulated cycle. And finally, we're going to talk about the role of um, elevated progesterones in an IVF cycle. So this is based on the topic, uh, all the topics that were presented um, at the ASRM, and these are some of the best uh, on, on this topic of ovarian stimulation in poor responders. So the first talk is a oral presentation by M. Youngster um, from the USA. He's actually um, associated with um, um, Harvard Medical School. His oral presentation is entitled a comparison of two ovarian stimulation protocols for poor responders undergoing IVF. The background of this, as we know, poor responders, it's always a, a difficult problem for our, all IVF infertility doctors. We're always talking about, is there a protocol that will best optimize not only the follicular response, number of eggs collected, but ultimately pregnancy rates and ongoing pregnancy, live birth rates. So uh, M. Youngster et al. Um, chose to compare two different types of protocol. Um, a protocol that is um, getting quite popular, you read that more and more, and we will be um, using a graph timeline form to show you in, in detail. But one is the um, GNRH microflare, I'll just call it the microflare protocol, and the other one is the luteal phase E2, followed by a normal antagonist protocol. This is not the first time that studies of this um, type have been done. Most studies haven't actually shown any difference, but he has done it in a different way, and I, I would like to present this. So what he has done is that he has used the same patient as a control. A lot of the criticisms of previous studies, if you're comparing one group with another group, the main question people are asking, are these comparable groups? Are they the same age, duration of infertility? So he's using the same patient that has started on one protocol and then obviously didn't get pregnant and then went on to the other protocol. Right, are you, are you with me so far? Okay, so within one year, so it has to be within one year because he doesn't want it to be two or three years. Within one year, patient has, that has particularly started on one protocol and uh, the protocol that is decided which patient start is based on, on the doctor, the physician in charge. So the physician decides which protocol the patient starts on and if the patient did not get pregnant within the, the one year and then they started on the other protocol, all these patients were included. So you can imagine there's not going to be many patients so over five years, he has managed to recruit 94 patients that fulfill all the inclusion criteria. He will look at all these 94 patients in terms of follicular response, in terms of number of eggs collected, but then in addition, which we, which we all has um, 
IVF doctors are most interested, he is going to look at ongoing pregnancies. But he's only going to look at a subgroup of these 94 patients, the subgroup that actually did the same type of treatment. So if they did IVF, then they did IVF. If they did uh, day two, day three transfers, then they did day two, day three transfers in the other, in the other, in both protocols. So patients that did different protocols were excluded. So out of the 94 patients that were initially included, only 44 patients satisfied the pregnancy, uh, ongoing pregnancy uh, results. So let's look at the, de the protocol in detail. Um, so the first one is a micro flare protocol. And only just um, last week, we uh, had a patient that, that started on this particular protocol. What it involves is he, he put them on the oral con contraceptive pill for about 10 days, seven to 14 days, stops the pill, induces a bleed, okay? Induces a bleed and then on the first day of the bleed, he will put the patient on a very small dose of agonist. Um, I'm not sure what sort of agonist uh, you use, but in terms of the dosage, the micro, that's why, that's why it's called micro flare, the dose will be about one-tenth, about 10% to 20% of the normal long down regulation agonist dose. So it starts that on that, and then after day two of the cycle, he will start the patient on FSH. So whether uh, in this case, in, in Harvard, uh, in Boston, Massachusetts, they put them on a mixture of recombinant um, HCG and HMG. So it doesn't really matter. You know, some people might just use recombinant, some people might use Menopure, some people might use um, HCG and Luveris, but it was used in the same protocol. We're okay so far? In the second one, which is a luteal uh, estradiol patch protocol, followed by a regular antagonist cycle, he would put them on 10 days after the LH surge. So if you searched on day 14, he will start you on day 24 of the cycle. He'll put you on a patch, um, 0.1 milligrams every other day. That was translated by Lawrence to me. QOD means every other day. Thank you, Lawrence. Um, and he also put them on the antagonist just to you know, uh, have more down regulation for the pituitary gland. He puts them on the patch all the way because he, he, he didn't use any pill. The patient will still have the period normally starts the um, FSH and HMG combination. And if you look at the results later on, you'll find that these are quite high doses. We're talking about 350, 400 in the end. Then this is just a regular antagonist cycle. Um, five, six days later, it will start them on the antagonist. Any, oh, no, no questions. You're not allowed to ask questions now. But these are the two protocols that we're going to compare. So what are the results? First set of results are purely on follicular response and number of eggs collected. So it's not looking at clinical pregnancy rates. And you'll find that in the microflare protocol, sorry, in the luteal estradiol patch followed by antagonists, you get more follicles, more eggs, and more mature oocytes. Not a lot more numerically, but significant, statistically significant more. Going more to the more important results, the pregnancy rates. But remember that from the original 94, he only had 44 in these cases. But look at the pregnancy rates, the ongoing um, pregnancy, clinical pregnancy rates compared to the micro flare. Much, much higher much, much more significant. I'm sure, I'm sure you will find um, lots of holes in these studies, and I'm sure Professor Chen will be tearing the study apart, but this is what has, he has shown, and I'm happy to um, answer any questions about this study, uh, not really defending it, but this is, the, this is the results. So what are the clinical what are conclusions? Okay, the conclusions based on the study, very straightforward. That if you use the estradiol patch followed by the an antagonist cycle, you are going to get more follicles, more eggs, more mature eggs, um, more uh, 
uh, fertilization, high implantation rate, high ongoing pregnancy rates. What are the um, clinical implications? That if you had a poor responder, naturally this is what you would do. But what I've just said is that this is not a randomized controlled trial. There are lots of holes in this study and really more, more needs to be done before we can say that all poor responders should go on the Estradiol patch protocol. Right, so we move on to the second talk. So this is a talk, uh, this is a poster presentation. Uh, it is a, uh, it is presented by um, Lei, Lei Lek, who is a, a person from Istanbul, Turkey, and it is based, uh, he's looking at AMH levels. So they is entitled the variations of AMH serum concentrations after COH treatment. The background to this is straightforward. I mean, if, if you are going to hyper-stimulate someone and you look at the AMH, AMH level, which is a reflection of ovarian reserve, you would assume theoretically that after the hyperstimulation, two or three months later, the AMH levels might drop because you have used up some of the oocytes. Um, lots of studies have been shown that there is no difference. Whether you, you do your baseline one, you stimulated it, and then you measure it later, there is no difference in AM. There is no statistically significant difference in AMH level. What he has done is that he has broken up the groups of patients based on high AMH levels, normal AMH levels, and low AMH levels. So his aim really is to determine whether ovarian hyperstimulation for IVF uh, changes the serum AMH levels in patients with these di different groups. He has defined the low AMH levels as less than 1.5 nanograms per mil. I mean, Dr. Vasan was talking just now that one of the um, OHSS um, AMH levels is at about 4.5. So patients with normal is defined as uh, 1.5 to 3.4, and high is defined as more than 3.5. Really, um, not too difficult a study to, to, to do. Um, he had um, 126 infertile patients. He divided them nicely, N equals 42, into three groups. He measured the AMH levels on day two of the starting cycle, and then three months later, he repeated their AMH. So you can't really fault the, 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 the materials and methods. This is the results. This is, the, this is low ovarian reserve, high and normal. These are the AMH levels before, the AMH levels after. You will notice that all the AMH levels drop three months after, but it drops the most in the low ovarian reserve. Hint, hint for your answer later on. Um, the difference is 3 point, uh, 0 0.35, and it is statistically significant. The rest of it, not. So what is he, um, what is he trying to say? Oh, this is, so, sorry, he has shown this in a graphical manner. So this is the basal AMH levels. So these are the low levels. This is going up to high basal. This is on day two AMH levels. This is the rate of decline of the AMH. So the higher you have the rate of decline, the more it drops. So it's just basically shown the, the previous slide results in, the, in a graphical manner that if you have low AMH levels, the rate of decline is higher. And as you get your AMH levels higher, the rate of decline is less and becomes non-statistically significant. So the conclusion, straightforward. So in, a, in the group with a low AMH level, which he has defined as less than 1.5 nanograms per mil, if you measured it, and then you measured it against three months after a stimulated cycle, there is a statistically significant drop in AMH. What does that mean? That could mean that you have to be careful when you're dealing with low responders and you're hitting them hard because they may have an accelerated um, oocyte uh, loss based on the drop in AMH levels.
And the last presentation is dear to my heart, if I can get it. The role of elevated progesterone. And it's dear to my heart because it's presented by, it's a poster presentation by Christos Venetis. Christos Venetis is, is originally from Greece. He has done a lot of paper in, um, in, um, with Koblianakis and based on LH, P4 um, levels during ovarian stimulation. January of uh, this year, he actually moved his whole family to Sydney, Australia. So he's now with um, both IVF Australia and the Royal Hospital for Women, where he's doing a lot of his research. So he published this paper. I, 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 this paper is actually independently uh, chosen by Global Fertility Academy. So when I told him this, I said, I'm coming all the way to Shanghai to present your, your poster. He said to tell them that it's been accepted by human reproduction. <laughs> so he's very happy. So it is entitled, The True Impact of Elevated Progesterone on the Day of HCG on Pregnancy Rates After IVF, a cohort analysis of more than 3,600 cycles. So the background to this is, um, if you were doing a stimulated IVF cycle, and during the cycle, um, I'm not sure whether some people do bloods, more, some people concentrate more on um, ultrasounds, but if you did bloods and you noticed that the progesterone rose during the cycle, are you concerned? There is always a worry that if the progesterone rises, you may have premature luteinization of the endometrium, and therefore the time to replace the embryo, you have passed the window of impl implantation and your pregnancy rate drops. So there's lots and lots of controversy about that. You can go to the literature, people are arguing to and fro. He has always argued, uh, Venetis has always argued that if the progesterone uh, rises, and he uses the term uh, PE, progesterone elevation, in a particular cycle during the IVF, you're going to have problems with the pregnancy rate at the end. And so much so that um, what we do now in, in my unit uh, is that if there is a rise in progesterone, we will still go ahead, we will collect, and we will freeze the embryos and replace in a different cycle. But this is his, this is his poster presentation. That um, he, his argument is that some of the people that have done the studies that have shown no difference in pregnancy rates have done it wrongly. He's basically saying that if you do a univariate analysis where you just look at either pure progesterones or elevated progesterones and look at pregnancy rates, so a univariate analysis, and you come to a conclusion, it may be a wrong conclusion because you haven't taken into account other confounding factors. And some of the other confounding factors so the, his aim of his study is to estimate the true effect of progesterone elevation on the day of HCG on ongoing pregnancy rates after removing any potential confounding factors effect. So these are the, um, these are the confounding factors he's going to talk about. He calls them known predictors, and they are confounding factors that everybody knows. You know, age of the woman, whether um, it's uh, day two transfer uh, or blastocyst transfer, um, what else has he got? Number of oocytes, number of, em number of embryos transferred. And his, his contention is that you must take all these into consideration uh, when you are looking at the end point, which is the ongoing or ongoing pregnancy rates. So it's a big retrospective study, big numbers, 3,617 uh, patients going, and he will be looking at two, two things. One is the progesterone concentration on the day of HCG, and he's also looking at an elevation in progesterone, yeah, an elevation of progesterone. So not only just the concentration, if it changes. So his change is defined as more than 1.5 nanograms per mil. So you look at these factors, multivariate, looking at all the uh, known predictors, and then looking at the end point. With me so far? Okay, so the first thing to say is that, and that's significant, about less, just slightly less than 7% of cycles, this is the 3,617 cycles, will have some form of progesterone elevation. So it's not, 
it's not an incidental thing. It's not like, you know, 0.5%, so let's not worry about it. Quite substantial. And then if you look at, these are the results, and if you look at the results, okay, let's look at this result first before I talk about this. If you look at multivariate, taking into account all the known predictors, then yes, if you have a higher uh, progesterone concentration on the day of HCG, if there is a rise in progesterone on the day of HCG, your pregnancy rates drop, okay? And it's significant, it doesn't cross one, so this is significant. But what he has also shown that if you did a univariate analysis, not taking into account the, progest the, the predictors, the confounding factors, um, although there is still a drop uh, if there was a progesterone elevation, okay, the opposite was found based on the concentration of the progesterone on the day of HCG. It was the opposite, that, that, that if you had a high progesterone, you have a higher pregnancy rates. It was not statistically significant. But I think what he's trying to say is that you, he's actually showing that if you did the univariate analysis, that's where you will get your problems, that you have to do a multivariate analysis. Conclusions are straightforward that if you have elevated progesterone independently, it's independently associated with lower ongoing pregnancy rates after fresh IVF cycle, and then you, if you want to do the studies, you have to take into account confounding factors. The clinical implications is, you know, in, in a unit, um, we don't do as many as 10,000 cycles. We, we do about four or 5,000 cycles a year. We would, um, we would not cancel the cycle in a progesterone elevation situation, but we would collect and freeze all and transfer in a later cycle. So in summary, So this study is um, a comparison, straight com forward comparison in poor responders. Poor responders has defined by youngster is FSH greater than 12. Uh, he's comparing two different types of protocol. One is a micro flare protocol um, uh, using the oral contraceptive pill in the first part and then a micro flare which is the agonist, low dose agonist followed by the FSH uh, stimulation versus a estradiol patch protocol started in luteal phase. He will continue that just until after he starts the FSH injections, followed by a regular day five, uh, day six flexible antagonist start. And he's found that the one with the luteal estradiol patch protocol produces more follicles, more eggs, more um, uh, fertilization, more embryos, and, and more importantly, more pregnancies and more ongoing pregnancies. Second study. By uh, Lelek from uh, Turkey is um, it's basically looking at AH, AMH levels when you start. So day two of cycle when you start and then three months after you, you, you after you finish that um, that IVF cycle. And he has found that although in normal and high AMH uh, patients, there is no change in uh, AMH level in the low AMH group, the ones that are less than 1.5, there is a statistically uh, drop in the um, AMH levels. And finally, uh, Venetis study shows that, um, that, that, um, each, that progesterone rise on the day of HCG does impact the ongoing pregnancy rates and that um, any other studies that uh, you're going to do should take into account confounding factors. Thank you very much for your attention.